there is such a thing as memory stems from a deeper idea that we are in fact a continuum and not a collection of unrelated states of mind. That the ego, whatever that is, has a past and that the past can be reconstructed through the mysterious faculty of recollection. That the, star, the states of mind that we conjure up with what we call our memory are not simply the avatars of our everlasting present, but light coming from the bygone stars we call our past. Out of the idea that individuals <coughs> have a memory, indeed, that the very notion of a person is memory conditioned, if we are to believe St. Augustine, comes the idea that collectives too have a memory. Do they have a memory because they are in some way persons? Or is collective memory nothing but the fabricated past collectives, personae ficti, make for themselves? And what does this ever-present doubt towards collective memory tell us about individual memory? To answer some of these questions and raise others, I have uh, the pleasure and honor of introducing to you uh, two professors, uh, Vered Vinitsky Sarusi and Leo Rabilsky. Uh, first, Professor Vered Vinitsky Sarusi is a sociologist at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, currently serves as the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences. She holds a position uh, of Faculty Fellow at the Center for Cultural Studies at Yale University. Her major academic uh, interests involve, uh, revolve around issues of collective memory and uh, commemoration, and specifically the ways in which societies cope with their difficult past and shameful histories. She published her books at the, with the University of Chicago Press, uh, State University of uh, New York uh, Press, and Oxford University Press. The recent one, uh, The Collective Memory Reader, is a joint project with two American colleagues, Jeffrey Olick and Daniel Levy. And she's currently conducting a comparative research on uh, home museums in Germany and Israel. Uh, she was born in Tel Aviv, lives in Ramat Gan, and as she says, is very familiar with Route 1 leading from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, she will, her first, our first talk in hers will be uh, the current challenge, challenge commemorating the difficult past. The notion of collective memory and our relations to the past is not, new, is not a new phenomenon. On the contrary, Zachor, remember, commanded by the Bible repeatedly. At the national level, however, the kind of preoccupation with the past has changed in the last 30 years or so. We are less interested in a paradise lost, heroic stories and monuments that fill our hearts with pride. Instead, we are interested in skeletons hiding in the closet, defeats, embarrassing moments, and human rights violations. The past threatens to penetrate the social scene, to change the narrative, to encourage new voices, new victims, new complaints, to demand justice and recognition. In the political sphere, democratic nations see fewer politicians who believe in their ability to win campaign or maintain worldwide popularity without apologizing for their father's sins. Bill Clinton apologized, Tony Blair apologized. In 2015, we witnessed the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe apologizing for abusing South Korean women during World War II. The known term is comfort women, which is a horrible term, but we're not gonna discuss that. The Pope, in a recent visit to Paraguay, used the opportunity to apologize on behalf of the Catholic Church for what he did against indigenous people in South and North America. Even Ahud Barak, who was Israel's prime minister and minister of defense, apologized some years ago for the way the Labor Party, the Israeli Labor Party, uh, behaved, treated Mizrahi Jews. And I'm not sure you know, but Israelis have a hard time apologizing. Commemoration of the good old days seems to be disappearing in favor of acknowledging of difficult past. But first, what is a difficult past? A difficult past is not necessarily more tragic than other commemorated past events. What constitutes a difficult past is an inherent moral trauma, tensions, and conflicts. In effect, the very same event can constitute a tragic past in one country or one culture and a difficult one in another. The Holocaust is, of course, the ultimate example. For Israel, it constitutes a tragic event, the most tragic event, while for Germany, it is a difficult past, a past with which Germans are ashamed of and guilty about. 
So the question is, how do we commemorate a difficult past? How do we cope with our embarrassing moments? In the words of Robin Wagner Pacifici and Barry Schwartz, how is commemoration without consensus and without pride possible? I find this question as very timely for many nations around the world. And what I will try to do in my uh, presentation today is to show you that there is more than one way of commemorating and coping with such a challenge. And I would like to suggest a theoretical model that explains the emergence of these different forms. I will use two examples, the Vietnam War and Rabin assassination. And while I, I, I believe that I don't need to introduce the Vietnam War and what it meant to Americans, to this audience, I will say a few words about Robin assassination for our guests from abroad. So forgive me, the local uh, crowd will forgive me for the next uh, uh, two minutes. On November 4, 1995, Israel's Prime Minister and Minister of Defense, Yitzhak Rabin, was assassinated in Tel Aviv. He had just addressed an enormous crowd of supporters at a demonstration advocating the peace process emerging at the beginning of the 90s with the Palestinians. His assassin, Igal Amir, an Orthodox Jewish law student, belonged to the radical Israeli right. Rabin's biography symbolizes the most important cornerstones of modern Zionist Israel, a much admired military officer who commanded a brigade that fought in the Jerusalem area during the 1948 Israel War of Independence. He was the Israeli defense, uh, uh, defense he was the Israeli Defense Force Chief of Staff during the 1967 war, at the conclusion of which the eastern and oldest part of Jerusalem and the West Bank were captured from Jordan, the Golan Heights from Syria, and the Sinai Desert and the Gaza Strip from Egypt, collectively referred to as the Occupied Territories, or the territories, or Judea and Samaria, and we can have a whole week of stormy seminar on how to call these territories. In many ways, he was the closest to what we may call the chosen son, the closest to the Israeli Mayflower one can imagine, at least until the 90s. In September 1993, during Rabin's second term as a, in office as a prime minister, the peace process with the Palestinians was officially initiated with the signature of Israeli and Palestinian leaders on the Oslo Accords. That Rabin was engaged in a peace process was evident to his political supporters, but it was not evident to all of his opponents who perceived any withdrawal from the occupied territories as a nightmarish peace, a disaster on many grounds. Thus, soon after the famous handshake between Rabin and Arafat at the White House in September 1993, Rabin became the primary target of harsh vilification on the part of many elements in the Israeli right who conducted an organized campaign against him in which he was labeled a traitor. While it seems that there is nothing in common between these two events, one is a war, the other is a political assassination, but they are the same as far as the social challenge they pose. Both are about moments that are highly troubled for their societies. Both contain narratives that are not shared by everybody. Both involve events that many wish to remember, many wish to forget, and most would prefer that they would not take place uh, at all. So how did these two societies cope with this challenge? Both commemorated these hard moments, but what we saw is totally different mnemonic reality. In the case of the Vietnam War in America, what we find in Washington DC is a multivocal commemoration composed of a wall with the name of the fallen soldiers, American soldiers, an American flag, a plaque, and two statues. More important yet, what we see in the capital is a multivocal commemoration which is about a shared space and a shared text that carries diverse meanings and thus can be peopled by groups with different attitudes of the war. 
those who su supported the war and those who were against it can share the same space even if they don't share the same interpretation of the war. In Israel, that was certainly not the case. Following Rabin's assassination, we saw what I call a fragmented commemoration. A fragmented commemoration includes multiple commemorations in various spaces and times where diverse discourses of the past are voiced and aimed at disparate audiences. Rabin's memorial space is divided between the reverence of the state-sanctioned gravesite in Jerusalem, here in the picture, not far from here. Rabin's gravesite is located in the middle of the plot of the greats of the nation. In keeping with the minimalist textual style of the other gravestones, the only word it bears are Rabin's name and years of his birth and death. Those who have no idea what happened may be puzzled by the uniqueness of the shape of the gravestone, but would not get any further information. How different is the, uh, the gravestone from the monument at the assassination site in Tel Aviv? The place screams the assassination. It is a street-level construction of four rows of four uneven and broken black bronze paving stones and compassed by a wide steel belt. The displaced stones represent the political and emotional earthquake that struck Israeli society when for the first time in its history, an elected prime minister was assassinated. The belt symbolizes the attempt to hold the pieces of the society together. One of the stones is larger and higher than the others bearing the inscription. Here, in this place, at the conclusion of the Shabbat, on November 4, 1995, the 12th day of Cheshvan, Prime Minister and Minister of Defense, Yitzhak Rabin, was assassinated. Peace is his legacy. The muted text at the state site stands in sharp contrast with the text on the monument in Tel Aviv. In addition, for years, what one could find graffiti expressing grief, you can see it on the walls, expressing grief and anger that were all over around the monument. The picture was taken in 2000. Now they are bounded in a specific wall space, but still they are there and they are updated, as you can see, following current events. What you see here is, uh, is the wall uh, in a picture that I took in 2015, uh, a picture of the reaction to the murder of Shira Banki, a teenager, and she was murdered in a gay parade in Jerusalem a few months ago. And the caption says, a, a hatred a murders or hatred kills. And this appears right near uh, the monument. No wonder the site emerged as a political shrine to the Israel's left. Rabin's memorial time is also divided between national uh, ritual held on Cheshvan 12, Yud Bet of Cheshvan, the Hebrew date, which is the official memorial day for the assassination, and blatantly in, uh, political events marked on November 4. The discourse differ across the diverse space and times. So how we can explain the two very different forms of commemoration, multivocal and fragmented. There are three conditions, and here is my model. There are three conditions that explain that. The first one is the political culture of the commemorated society. The second is the temporal consideration. And the third involves the power of the agents of memory. Let me elaborate a bit on each of these conditions. The first one is the political culture of the commemorated society. While societies are never entirely one thing or the other, one can still speak with relatively certainly certainty about the political culture of a society, about a general atmosphere that one can sense. America coped with cultural wars, a civil war, with conflicts and disputes. But it admires, it admires pluralism and diversity and individualistic culture, but more than anything else, it appreciates consensus and suspects conflicts. 
Despite all, American society is relatively consensual and a commemoration of even a controversial past can therefore be multi, can be multi vocal representing a product of a compromise. I'm not saying that there were not arguments, but at the end of the day, a compromise has been reached and the parties involved respected that. This is reflected, for example, in a title of a television docudrama that documented the process in America and was called Healing the Nation. How different the case is for Israeli society. Although Jewish Israeli seems to share a consensual Zionist narrative, but on, not only the Zionist narrative eroded and challenged in the last uh, years, but also its former ability to keep the existence of other of social cleavages in check has been rapidly diminishes. For the last four decades, Israeli society has been characterized by deep, highly politicized and often overlapping cleavages Couples with an inability to regulate, let alone resolve, social and political conflicts. And that encouraged social and political fragmentation. Within such a political culture, the discourse of solidarity heard at the wake of Rabin assassination came only from the Israeli right, while the left expressed dissensus, resentment, and a great deal of anger. The next dimension is the relevance of the past or the issue of timing. The second dimension affecting the kind of commemoration that emerges has to do with the timing of the commemoration or in other words, the relevance of the past to present. To be sure, every commemoration takes place in some present time as, and is affected by it. Obviously, if the past did not matter to anyone, probably no one would bother to represent it. But my point is that certain pasts are still an integral part of current partisan politics and social realities. Some of the pasts are still very much present and thus more likely to become fragmented commemoration. By the same, by the same token, the relative irrelevance of the past to present agenda may enable the enactment of multivocal consensual commemoration. What may intensify the likelihood of fragmented or a multivocal commemoration is the length of time that has elapsed between events and their commemoration. The longer one waits, the better the chances of a, multivo of a multivocal commemoration. It took America almost 60 years after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated to dedicate the Lincoln Memorial. When the monument was dedicated decades after the actual events, those for whom the, mom the memory is first hand, part of their personal biography are either dead or at least pretty old. Few of the people who attended the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial had experienced the American Civil War. Perhaps what enabled America to cope with its difficult past, and it was difficult, is precisely the fact that by the time the dedication ceremonies took place, the burden of those who bore the marks of the past on their bodies and in their souls had become the social yet once removed memories of others. The past is no longer an autobiographical one, but a historical one, one that is mediated, not personally recalled. But time does not necessarily work in a linear way. And thus, while only nine years divided the, the, between the death of the last American soldier in Vietnam and the dedication of the monument in 1982, the war was over and was no longer part of American agenda. Such relative irrelevance of the past to the present contributed to the construction of multivocal commemoration. Rabin's commemoration began within one week after the assassination. One week, can you imagine that? This is a pace that even in the age of memory rush and hecticness is unprecedented. The people who lived through the trauma and those who were accused, rightly or wrongly, of responsibility were very much alive. 
Six short months after the assassination, Benjamin Netanyahu, who had been one of the leaders of the campaign against Rabin, became prime minister. More important, the peace process with the Palestinians, which was at the heart of the conflict, has not yet ended and is still at the center of the Israeli agenda. And from what I see outside my office in Jerusalem, it will be here for quite some time. A current agenda coupled with virtually no elapsed time between the event and its commemoration is certainly difficult ground on which to construct a multivocal commemoration. In other words, it is the relevance or the irrelevance of the past to the present that generates, respectively, a fragmented or a multivocal commemoration. The last uh, dimension is the agents of memory, the third. And this is about the people who are behind the commemoration. And here we are talking about the agents of memory. Determination obviously characterized all agents of memory. If they did not care about their past, they wanted to commemorate, they would not spend time, their time erecti erecting a monument, or they wouldn't do that with, li or they would do that, do that with little enthusiasm. And yet, the power of agents of memory varies. The type of commemoration enacted depends considerably on the relative power of those who do commemoration. Rabin's agents of memory held significant political, economic, social, and symbolic power and capital. Many of them were college professors, well-known journalists, well-to-do business people, popular artists, and alike. Under such social circumstances, it is likely that a fragmented type of commemoration will emerge. While Rabin's agents of memory had to compromise where the state was involved, for example, in the kind of text written on Rabin's gravesite in Jerusalem, state recognition was not the end of the story, but only its beginning. While in all likelihood, John Scruggs and other American Vietnam veterans could never have built a memorial without the assistance of the state and other organizations, Rabin's agents of memory formed voluntary associations, raised substantial amount of money and appropriate public spaces and times in which their narrative of the assassination could be held outside the official framework. Each and every year for the last years, the annual memorial ceremony for Rabin at Rabin Square takes place. This is an event which is not an official one, and thus it is not supported by the state. It costs, when one knows how to organize it, around $200,000. Someone has to have the money to fund it, fund it for the last 20 years. In addition, the composition of the commemorative committee may send a message regarding the tone of the desired outcome. The, the men and women who deferred, deferred visibly and widely on many political issues, but share the desire to honor the Vietnam veteran and who are all consensual figures, transmitted the message of consensus and sharing to the rest of American publics. How different it is when the agents of memory share the same political views of the event and when the primary agent of memory, Leah Rabin, the widow, was a controversial figure as was the case for the commemorations of Rabin assassination. Let me try and draw some conclusion and see why is it important to know anything about commemoration. It is clear that both types of commemoration, multivocal as the cases for the Vietnam uh, War and fragmented as the cases for Rabin assassination, do not serve to resolve social conflicts, but to represent and express them. A multivocal commemoration has the potential of attracting people with diverse views of the past, supported or objected of the war, to remember in a shared space or time. Thus, it is about building and enhancing social solidarity despite disagreement. At least we meet in the same space and share it. In a world filled with conflicts and tensions, I would not underestimate the power of such shared social space. In contrast, a fragmented commemoration that consists of multiple and diverse time and spaces and in which different discourses of the past are enacted and expressed in order to appeal to diverse groups does not enhance social solidarity. 
and more than representing social conflicts, fragmented commemoration may shape them by offering contentious collectives what they scarcely could have laid claim to before the monuments were erected and the memorial days were set. A place to meet, a time to share, and a discourse to cherish. Fragmented commemoration thus can be seen as reinforcing, even building a dissensus. Memorial rituals and monuments enable societies to come to terms with their past, resolve tensions and conflicts, provide solidarity and reassurance, take the burden of memory away from the people or enhance social conflicts. It is also important to know that commemoration are never static. There are monuments that lost their audience and were left to total oblivion. There are memorials, rituals that gained new insights. We have a world with, we have with us a world expert on that right here in this hall. Social conditions may change. Political cultures may change. So is the relevance of the past commemorated and the power of the agents involved. In Rabin's case, a future, more consensual political culture combined with a change in agency and perhaps a solution to the conflict with the Palestinian may change the way Israeli understand the assassination and remember Rabin. This is what happened to the commemoration of Abraham Lincoln 60 years after he was assassinated and when America on the eve of World War I was looking for inspiration and it may happen to Yitzhak Rabin one day too. One last note. American society may never reach a consensus on the Vietnam War, but its dissensus shares the same commemorative space. Such social practice may even imply that in one way or another, American society has in fact come to term with its difficult past. Those who want or are obligated to remember Rabin hardly share the same space, time or discourse. There is no sense of healing the nation. When dedicating the Korean War Veterans Memorial, President Clinton, Bill Clinton, said, for many, we are one. The appropriate dedication in the case of Rabin in Israel might be, for many, we are even more and more and more. Thank you very much.